I've logged about 12,000 deliveries between the three giant American delivery apps, Uber Eats, Grubhub, and DoorDash. But more recently, I recorded three different videos. The first one was about how you can maximize your income up to about $12,000 in a month. The second one was about why this professional is not going to last and why you need to diversify your income. And in the third one, I went into detail about four ways that these apps toy with your emotions and why they're not sustainable in the long run. Now, over the last month or so, you guys have asked me hundreds of questions. Some of those include how to get reactivated from DoorDash, how to get reactivated from Grubhub, how to make over $35 an hour, how do I do my taxes, how do I collect and analyze my data, how long does it take to get started with DoorDash, how do I become a top dasher and is it worth it? Should I take this full-time or part-time? So I'm gonna do my best to answer the most frequently asked questions to the best of my knowledge. Hey, my name is Christian, but you can call me Lil. I'm back in my favorite part of London, Richmond Park, but I recorded about half this video at San Francisco International, so <laughs> if you see me flipping back and forth, I'm gonna apologize in advance for that. This video is going to be very dense. It's gonna be jam-packed with information. I probably could split this one into at least five different videos, but I ain't got time for that. I'm trying to jam all this information into one video because I really want to move on. In the next couple of weeks to months, I'm gonna be making a lot more videos about money, entrepreneurship, lifestyle travel, and health that you're really not gonna to wanna to miss. Make sure that you like this video, subscribe, hit that bell button so that you don't miss any notifications. There is one question that I'm gonna make a totally separate video for, and that is how can you get free food? There's a hack that I use to get free and discounted food by basically reusing the same coupon codes over and over and over again. That's a process, and so I'm gonna describe it in a totally separate video. Make sure that you're subbed if you don't wanna miss that one. One question that I've received a lot is, what are your key metrics? How do you decide when to take an order? There are a lot of people out there who will say either $1 a mile or it needs to be $2 a mile or something like that. I don't pay very close attention to the dollars per mile because um, there are three things that are way more important in my opinion. First of all, you need to know your opportunity cost. What could come about at this time of day? Now, what I did when I first started was at the end of the day, I would go through and I would insert the times based on the region, like five to six, six to seven, seven to eight, etc., the hour, and, and the amount of money that each order that I got was. You know what you can expect during each hour. You insert that into a spreadsheet and you average it out across the week. You average it out across Tuesdays, across Wednesdays, across Thursdays, so you know approximately what you can expect during this time of day, this time of week, and you know what kind of orders to look for. What I accept at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday is gonna to look totally different than what I accept at 7 p.m. on a Saturday. So the answer is a little bit more complicated than that. What do I look for, $1 per mile or $2 per mile? But it does, it does have something to do more to do with the opportunity cost, what I could get during this time period. I didn't always have like the exact number in my brain. It's not like I, I kept the spreadsheet in front of me at all times. I did have a pretty general idea based on the statistics that I had gathered. And these are all long-term statistics. Remember, there can be flukes at any time of day. You might get something good, but you can't count on flukes. The second thing that I would pay attention to is what restaurant it was going to. Because I would rather take, say, a $10 order that was coming from Jersey Mike's than a $15 order that was coming from Chipotle even if they're going to the same place because the truth is that 80% of the time of Chipotle I had to wait 15 minutes and at Jersey Mike's they pretty much always had the food ready to go that's just an example it might be totally different in your market so I, I don't I don't pay super close attention to the dollars per mile um, but I also pay attention to where it's going is this somewhere that I can get to on the freeway or is this somewhere that I have to drive exclusively through neighborhoods because the freeway is in two or three times as fast as the neighborhoods that's something that you do need to consider there's no perfect formula for this. I say first you collect statistics and I'm going to go more into how I collect statistics in a later question. You collect statistics, you get a general idea of what you can expect during a certain time of day and you get a general idea of what you can expect from different restaurants and that's how you decide. It takes a little setup, it takes a little thought at first but over time it just kind of becomes instinctual. How do you keep track and compile that data? Well it depends. So when I'm, the data that I was talking about just now, about like what can I expect on Tuesday between 6 and 7 p.m., you look at your order history every single day, write that directly into a spreadsheet. I use Google Sheets. Okay, I just wanna give you guys a quick demo of what this actually looks like. From before I started multi-apping, I, I seem to have lost my data from directly after, um, but this will give you the idea of what I was working with here. And you insert it into a spreadsheet like this. So I, I did a few different things that give you basically an idea, the sort of orders that I can expect during a certain time interval. So if I wanted to look at like five to 6 p.m., for example, if I get a lot of orders in like in the 12 to 17 kind of range, 
I'm going to be tempted to be look, looking out for those orders on Saturday between 5 and 6 p.m. You organize it by the hour. This takes a little bit of time, but it's worth it, trust me. So you insert into a spreadsheet, you organize it by day of the week, you organize it by time of the day, and then you can apply some formulas and graphs and stuff like that so that you can kind of visualize it a little bit better. You don't have to collect months of information. You can, you can stop out after a couple of weeks to, once you've kind of gotten the general idea. Four weeks of data is like gonna change your life, but once you get eight weeks of data, it might improve you a little bit, but it's not going to it's not going to change your life again. So that data I collected directly from the apps. I would just I would just type it into a spreadsheet and then I would apply my formulas. This spreadsheet that's up on the screen right now, if you want that in the comments below that you say I want that spreadsheet and and I will send you a link. You will need to insert your own data into that. The, all of the formulas will carry over so everything should be automatic. I've been asked a lot of different questions about like the process of getting signed up with Uber and how flexible it actually is. I will just tell you this, it's super easy and it's super flexible. Uh, when I started DoorDash, I, I had to wait for my DoorDash red card to come in the mail. Since then it's become a lot easier as far as I know. When I, when I got deactivated and I re got a new account, I was able to get back up in like half an hour or something like that. Basically, you can dash anytime you want. You just create a schedule when you want to work, whenever you want to work, and you stop working whenever you want. And if you don't show up for your shift, they don't care. Nobody cares. It's not like a regular job. It's completely flexible, completely at your will. And the great thing about DoorDash is that you can dash anywhere, anywhere that they have a DoorDash zone, you can just go. So I've met people along the road who literally just travel around the country from city to city door dashing along the way. It is kind of hard because you can't do that with Grubhub. You have to get approved for every individual market, which does kind of make things more difficult. And on Uber Eats, you can actually do the same thing if you have a car that meets all the requirements, but the requirements do change from zone to zone. So if your car doesn't meet the requirements in a certain zone, then you can't do it, unfortunately. For me, even my sister's car didn't actually meet the requirements in San Francisco, for example and so I can't do Uber Eats in San Francisco. I can only do it in my local area and other small towns. But if you do have a car that meets Uber Eats requirements, then you can also Uber Eats all around the country. How to get reactivated once you've been deactivated. I've only been asked this about uh, DoorDash, but I have been deactivated by both DoorDash and Grubhub, and the process for getting my accounts back was exactly the same. For starters, I cannot guarantee you that this is gonna work. I can only tell you that this is what worked for me. I've seen a whole bunch of like spammy bot type posts about how you can pay this fee to get them to contact DoorDash on your behalf and it'll guaranteed to get you reactivated. As far as I can tell, none of those work. Don't even try. There may be people even who are commenting below who are guaranteeing or, or promising you that they can get your accounts back if you're watching this. The answer is they can't. Don't listen to them. I would delete them if they come onto this video, but if I, are there any that I don't see, just ignore them, please. This, they, they will not work. They will steal your $20 or $50 or however much it costs and you won't get your account back. Just listen to what I have to say and try this. Because I know that people are going to ask, it was because of my completion rate. I really think DoorDash is treating themselves in the foot with this one because essentially it makes me way more exclusive with the DoorDash orders that I'm willing to accept in the first place. I might accept a $10 Uber Eats order with the knowledge that if like a $15 order from another app comes in, I can just unassign it. What I'll do is I'll just reject that $10 DoorDash order because if I unassign it, I'm getting punished for it and I'm aware of that. So I've become much more picky with the DoorDash orders that I'm willing to accept. Um, and that hurts DoorDash because they have to up the price every time somebody declines an order. So here's how I get my account reactivated. Essentially, I signed up for a new one, but I changed every single piece of information that I didn't need. DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, they use some combination of your factors, your email address, your phone number, your address, your name, etc., to figure out if you're the same person as another user. However, what they don't use for that purpose is your social security number. And that's the only thing that actually has to be exactly the same. So what you do is you change everything else. You change your phone number, you get you go sign up on Google Voice and you get a brand new phone number. I created a new email address and I forwarded it to my old email address. I changed my physical address, I changed it to like a PO box and I actually changed my name. Your first and your last name have to be your real names, They're, that's that's legal. However, you can change your middle name. The first time I signed up for a DoorDash account, I didn't have a middle name, so when I went back to do it a second time my middle name is Alexander I put 
the middle name in there, Christian Alexander Oskimo. If you put your middle name last time, you can just delete it this time, or you can use your middle initial, or whatever it is you wanna do. Essentially, you're changing every piece of verifiable information that you are who you are, except your social security number. That's the only thing that has to stay the same, because you have to be that person for tax purposes or whatever. But as far as I know, they don't use your social security number to verify your identity. They only use it for the background check and for tax purposes. Now again, this worked for me. It worked for both DoorDash and Grubhub. I cannot guarantee that it will work for you, but it's worth trying. So to summarize that, you're gonna change your email address, you're gonna change your phone number, you're gonna change your physical address, but make sure that it's one that you can get stuff at because they're gonna send you your Dasher card and your bag. You're going to change your name. You're gonna add your middle name or subtract your middle name or change it to your middle initial, whatever you have to do to change it. And, and that's pretty much it. They haven't caught on. I've done another 1,200 deliveries on both DoorDash and Grubhub since creating a new account. Now the next question is, can you make DoorDash full-time or is it just a part-time job? Is it better part-time versus full-time? Those are kind of along those lines. And I have to say that this totally depends on your market and like what you want to get out of it because DoorDash can give you some things, but it can't give you everything. Like I said in my video about what DoorDash doesn't want you to know, you have to diversify. In my opinion, this should not be a full-time job, at least not, not a long-term full-time job. You need to diversify and you need to think about your exit plan because this job is not gonna last forever. As a general rule, it's a very insecure job and you can be booted anytime. And the wages for that job will continue to go down. So if you wanna take it full-time, I would recommend having an exit plan, diversifying your income. Think really hard about your future. As I detail in my $12,000 a month video, there's a lot of money to be made, but take that money and stash it in a bank. Take that money and become an entrepreneur. Take that money and do something bigger with it because the truth is they don't care about you and they will kick you to the curb as soon as it suits them. One of the problems with DoorDash is that a lot of people see it as like having their own business. In a lot of ways it is. You can decide to when to work, where to work, why to work. You can decide how much money you wanna make to a certain extent and you're just totally free to make your own decisions and so in that respect it is your own business but that comes with a caveat they expect you to take all the risk like the up and down of the market as I showed in my my very emotional video that can take its toll yes there is some money to be made but they make you take on all the risk while at the same time not really giving you any of the benefits of a big business because a big business has unlimited scalability unlimited growth and unlimited potential for moving up in your career but in DoorDash there's just not none of that stuff exists but my point is that a real real job, a regular job, a W-2 job, usually gives you a certain amount of security, usually gives you a way to improve your skills, it usually gives you long-term career potential, and I don't, I hate W-2 jobs, I'm not trying to say you should go out and get one, but what I am saying is that if you're going to take on the risks of a real business, start a real business. You can use DoorDash in the meantime while the money's still good, but use that time, use that money to start a real business. Take the risk, get the reward. Sorry, that was a tangent. To answer the question about should you take this full-time or part-time, Yes, whatever suits you. But at the end of the day, if you want it to be full-time, make sure that you have an exit plan. Make sure that you're stashing money away for a rainy day. Make sure that you're working on your skills, you're working on advancing yourself. Ultimately, if you don't, they're not going to help you. There's nobody who can help you, it's only you. There's like a very similar question, how much money can you make full-time? And like I said in my $12,000 a month video, I, I made $12,000 in a month. So that is theoretically possible. I did work about 84 hours that week. But even if you split that in half, $6,000 a month isn't that bad. And if you work just evenings and weekends, it's probably more like 7,500, not 6,000. So there is definitely some money to be made. There are some indications that the market is taking a big downturn. However, depending on your market, there's definitely still some money to be made. As long as you're following the right strategies, you're multi-apping, you're stacking orders from multiple apps, you've got to do those things, but you also need to take care of yourself, take care of your mental health. Go do things that you enjoy. Make sure you set rules for when you're going to work and, and how you're going to use the money that you get. I know that's easier said than done. This video isn't about advice on how to do that. This video is just to answer the question. You can make a full-time living. How do you politely ask somebody to hurry up? I never asked anyone to hurry up. However, what I would do is as soon as I got to a restaurant, I would say, hey, hey I'm here for blank, the name. If they said, okay, I'll go check on it. When they came back, I would always say, about how long do you think it's gonna take? It's a very non-confrontational way of saying hurry up. And what it does is it's polite, 
but it's still firm. And if they said it was gonna take a long time, I would say something like, okay, thank you, but I'm, I'm gonna cancel this. Somebody else will be by. Just always be polite. These people at the restaurant are just workers. They have, they have very little control over how long the food actually takes. But what they do have control over is how much attention they're paying to you. So you go in, you be firm, but you be polite. Say, about how long is this gonna take? What it does is it puts you in their mind. It says, it says I'm gonna remember that guy is there waiting for this food. What happened a lot in my early days of DoorDash is I would go in and they would say it's not ready yet and then sometimes it, it would become ready and they still wouldn't bring it out to me for like 10 minutes or whatever because I didn't know it was ready and they the people who were working there didn't didn't really necessarily know or think about me in terms of like this food needs to go to that person but if you do something a little bit different and you put it in your mind while you're also being polite you say about it's a little bit less rude less confrontational about how long is that gonna take? And they go in and they find out probably about five minutes, something like that. And then once it hits five, six minutes, you, you try to flag down the same person and say, hey, can, do you think you could just check on that again for me? Usually they're like, yeah, sure. These people are people, they're fun, they're friendly, they're polite, they're just like you and me, they're not against you. If somebody is particularly rude to you, then you can still be polite and firm and say, you know what, I, I really don't appreciate being talked to like that. It's important that you don't take shit from anybody, but you're still polite. I've seen so many dashers come in, they're waiting like 15, 20 minutes, and only then do they find out it's gonna be another 20 minutes, and then they just get pissy and like, oh, I've been waiting here for blah, blah, blah. Nobody knew you were waiting there, okay? Go in, ask how long it's gonna take. They'll usually be honest with you. And if it's longer than 10 or 15 minutes or longer than you're, you're willing to wait, just say thank you very much, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna cancel this one. Somebody else will be in here in a few minutes. Kind of in that same vein there, be honest about how long you're willing to wait. You're not gonna give up a $30 order for a 15 minute wait, obviously. Is it worth it to be top dasher? <laughs> the short answer is that for 98% of you, no, absolutely not. Essentially what you're forced to do if you want to be top dasher is keep an acceptance rate above 70% and a completion rate above 95% and therein lies the problem. For starters, and if you're multi-apping, which I always am, if you get a DoorDash order while you have a Grubhub order, for example, you have to give it up. Otherwise, you will lose your top dasher status. And anybody who's got a, a, an acceptance rate above 70% with DoorDash doesn't have the self-respect to not take three, four, five dollar orders. Now, there is an argument to be had about like, if you can't multi-app for one reason or another, maybe you just don't think that you can handle it. Maybe there are no other apps in your area. Like, let's just say Grubhub and Uber Eats, they just don't even exist in your area. If those apps don't exist at all, that probably means that the DoorDash schedule is also quite sparse. So if you are unable to get a schedule and there are no other apps available, then there's obviously a case that in order to get any work at all, you have to be top dasher. And when I started doing DoorDash, I was top dasher. And I still made about $20 an hour. So it, it's not, there's definitely some money to be made. I wouldn't call $20 an hour nothing. It's definitely something, especially back when I started. We, we didn't live in the current jobs climate. But at the same time, you will need to accept that there's just no chance that you're ever gonna hit numbers like, $35 an hour. It, it, it just won't work and you're going to have to take crappy orders that are like three, four, five dollars. And for me personally, when I was top dasher, that's when my ratings were the lowest because those customers that don't tip, those three, four dollar customers, those are the ones that also give you the worst rating. 4.7 is nowhere near getting deactivated, but but there's, there's increased risk there that you're going to have worse customers, you're gonna to have to deal with bad people, you're going to feel crummy about yourself taking these three and four dollar orders, 225, they go as low as 225, in order to get top dasher. So for most of us, I think that we're much better off multi-apping and giving up top dasher altogether. However, there might be a very small subset of people where it's better just to be top dasher. I do have to say, for those people who want to be top dasher, you don't actually have to have a 70% acceptance rate and a 95% completion rate. I discovered towards the end of my being a top dasher, you only have to meet the criteria on the last day of the month. You can be the most picky dasher all the time until the very last two or three days of the month and your, your previous 100 deliveries, those are the only ones that actually qualify you for Top Dasher. What would I do differently if I had to start over? How, what would my journey look like? This question isn't that easy to answer because it just totally depends on the market. But what I can say is that waiting 
for your order and sitting in traffic are the two biggest time killers. Bad traffic will take a 10 minute order and turn it into a 40 minute order. I would do absolutely whatever I could to avoid traffic. Figure out where the traffic's gonna be and avoid it like the plague. And avoid restaurants. Keep note of how long you're waiting at different restaurants and always avoid, always. If there's a chance you're gonna have to wait 15 minutes, reject, that's an auto reject from me. To give you an example, let's if I got two orders at the same time, one was for Jersey Mike's and the other was for Chipotle, eat both were $10, but the Jersey Mike's was five miles and the Chipotle was 0.2 miles, I would rather take the Jersey Mike's still because Chipotle, there's a good chance I'm gonna have to wait 15 minutes and Jersey Mike's pretty much always has it ready to go. So you can see that from purely cost perspective, that 15 minute wait is eight minutes longer than the seven minute drive. The next question is what kind of car do you drive? And I have to say this is actually probably one of the most important questions because I have a 2005 Prius and before I bought the Prius, I was driving a 2002 slug bug. I was driving it because it's cheap, but the truth is the difference between 20 miles per gallon of the slug bug and 50 miles per gallon of the Prius is like $500 a month. You think to yourself, I bought my Prius for $2,500 a month. That's in five months, the Prius pays for itself in gas alone. So I don't know if you've thought about investing in a hybrid. Definitely pay attention to your gas mileage. Pay attention to how much you're actually spending every day, every month. Do the math. How much? How many months would it take for you to actually pay for a used hybrid vehicle? Take a look at the market and actually, like literally, pen and paper, do the math. Figure out how long it would take. Put it in the comments below because for me, it was only five months. So one question that I've gotten a few times is, my car doesn't meet Uber Eats requirements, how can I still drive for Uber Eats? <laughs> the answer is that my car also doesn't meet Uber Eats requirements. The problem is that Uber is also a taxi service, so they have to have certain requirements for the passengers, but for some reason they make you conform to those same requirements for Uber Eats when you're delivering food. And what I do is, my sister has a broken down car, in the driveway that technically meets their requirements. So I just send in my sister's registration, I insured it for one day and then canceled the insurance and sent in the document and they approved it as if I was driving my sister's car, which again is broken down in the driveway. And then I just deliver food with my Prius and nobody, nobody cares. If you're carrying passengers, they probably will, do not do that. So the next question that I get probably asked most often is how do you do your tax? And this question is, is complicated uh, and I'm gonna try to simplify it. But basically, DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, everybody sends you a 1099 at the end of the year or on, by like January 31st. So I just got my Uber Eats one already. I think my DoorDash ones are coming soon. Essentially, you're going to use those to tell the IRS how much you made. Now, they already know how much you made, so don't bother trying to lie. It's just going to backfire. You're going to enter in how much you made on DoorDash, Uber Eats, and Grubhub. And yes, you do have to include your tips as far as I know. I obviously don't actually count my cash tips. However, technically you are legally obliged to do so. Um, did I just admit to, to tax fraud on camera? Okay, so the next step here is you really need to, during the entire time that you're working, you really need to keep track of your miles. This is probably the deduction that a lot of people miss. There's something called adjusted gross income. It's your income minus your deductions. Miles are called a depreciable deduction. I don't remember, it's the kind that doesn't have a direct cost, it's just the depreciation of your car. For every mile that you drive, you get 58 cents off of your taxable income. So if I made $20,000 and I drove 10,000 miles, that means that I get 58 cents for every mile equals $5,800 off of my taxable income. So now I can only be taxed on $14,200. Now what you're gonna wanna do is you want to make sure that this is as accurate as possible. A lot of people use apps, I don't. You can, you can actually keep track of it yourself and put it into a spreadsheet, but make sure you keep exact track of it. Now, technically speaking, you are not allowed to count your commuting miles. That does not mean like your time to the restaurant. That means like your time when you first, when you leave to your house to when you get to your zone. But as soon as you become available for taking orders, you're on the job and those miles count. What I do, because I actually start my shift in my zone, as soon as I'm like just about ready to go, I will turn on uh, DoorDash, I'll turn on Grubhub and Uber Eats. And from that moment on, I am on the job. And what that means is that I can count those miles from the moment that I leave my house. If you're like done for the day, and you start going home, you're commuting again, and you're not supposed to count those miles. However, there's a bit of a gray area if, quote unquote, you would take a good order, for example. So I always used to leave DoorDash on all the way back to my house, and I would, I would, if a good enough order came in, I would take it. That's a bit of a gray area, because you're technically commuting home while at the same time at work. I count those miles, it is a bit of a gray area, but if you have to commute home back to outside of your delivery zone, 
then those miles don't count. A lot of people will, will suggest these apps to count your miles and those are definitely helpful, but I, I don't. I just use a spreadsheet and I, I put in my miles at the end of the day, I put in the date, put in a little information into what I was doing, like uh, the start time, the end time, and the number of orders. Put this on, on my tax return like two or three times already and the IRS has never asked me for detailed information. However, they could theoretically ask you for that documentation. So make sure that you have it. Don't just make stuff up. Take really meticulous notes. Now there's something important to note is that if you've added that mileage deduction, you're not allowed to count gas or maintenance on your car or anything like that. You can do maintenance on your car and gas or you can do the mileage. You can't do both. However, you can add on expenses like your cell phone, your cell phone bill. Anything that has to do with your car counts as part of that mileage deduction. So don't, so nothing, insurance, gas, nothing. It's just miles. In my spreadsheet with all of my miles, I also have a, another column that shows me like how much I spent on food, for example, because you can also deduct your expenses from food. Now, a lot of people will say that you don't take any orders that are under like a dollar per mile and that's great and everything because you can count the miles that you're, you're like searching for food. A lot of people will probably make like less than that. We might make 50 cents, 60 cents, 70 cents per mile that they drive. There's a decent chance that your adjusted income is like zero or close to it. Okay, somebody asked me what is the easiest way to get deactivated. Can't tell you exactly what the easiest way to get deactivated is, but I can tell you I got deactivated because my completion rate fell below 80% and DoorDash did give me a warning. I didn't think they were serious, if I'm honest. They kind of let me go for a long time and they gave me several warnings and I totally deserved it. I mean, I didn't deserve it because it's a stupid policy to begin with, but at the same time, I was aware that there was a policy and I kept breaking it. So <laughs> from my perspective, that seems like the easiest way to get deactivated. However, I have heard of some people getting deactivated for like a single wrong address. What kind of bad habits have you picked up doing DoorDash? And, and for me, I did kind of outline a few of these in my previous video about four ways that the, the gig apps, they manipulate your mental state and your mentality. Like for example, one of the, some of the bad habits include going out when I'm tempted to go out because DoorDash says it's busy and then it's not, even though I was supposed to be doing something else. Another one of the bad habits are eating too much food, like delivery food. I'm gonna create another video very soon about free and discounted food from Grubhub. I have to say that I ate Grubhub every day because of that. It was just easier and cheaper than making food at home because I could use my discount codes over and over and over again. So that was probably my worst bad habit. The truth is the Grubhub, they almost exclusively have bad unhealthy food. You really don't want to eat what they have to offer every day. It's just horrible for you. How do I use Google Maps to like map out my entire route? So if you watch my previous $12,000 month video, you'll see that I enter the entire route on Google Maps continuously so I can visualize the entire thing from restaurant to restaurant to house to house. I'm not in Oregon right now, I'm in London, uh, but I'm gonna try my best here. Let's just say I wanna go to Asena, which is a, a restaurant in, in Twickenham near here. Basically, if you see these three dot thing in the top here, you can, you can click on this once you have the directions up and you can say add stop. Well, first I want to go to, let's just say I'm going to Twickenham and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to Kingston. For example, you can see the entire route right here. So, so if I, if I'm on, if I'm on Uber Eats or DoorDash or whatever, and I can see, and then order comes in, I can quickly just flip to the map and say, okay, how well did those match? And then when I get to another restaurant, I can say, move up. You can, you can move these around as you see fit address or whatever. So you can visualize the entire route. I'm gonna be honest, that isn't terribly easy to show on the camera, um, but I hope you get the gist of it. Essentially, those three little dots in the upper right hand corner, they will allow you to add stops. And so you can put in multiple addresses, multiple restaurants, however you want, and you can switch them up to see what the fastest route is. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I know it was long. I tried to rush through as many of those questions as I could, so I know I didn't go into a whole lot of detail. If you want more detail about any of them, you didn't understand anything, please comment below and let me know. I will do my best to answer you. If you have any important questions, Questions that I didn't answer also put it in the comments I'm gonna do my best to answer in text I really didn't want to make this multiple videos though because I'm gonna be moving on with new videos about entrepreneurship lifestyle travel and health that you're really not gonna to want to miss so make sure that you subscribe like this video hit that bell button do what you do to make sure that you get notified when those new videos drop ciao bella